Uh, welcome to a positively horrible video. Uh, I'm not really actually sure why I'm doing this. I've just always, kind of always wanted to. So uh, here we go. Uh, what I've got is a uh, 1990, 1990, yeah, uh, Saab 900S. Uh, it's got a lot of miles on it. The odometer shows 243,000, but the odometer doesn't work. So it's got a lot more than that. Uh, I spent a bunch of time uh, trying to get the motor to run right. Finally got that going, uh, took it for a few drives, and then the transmission failed, which, you know, old cars, what are you going to do? Uh, so now having put a bunch of work into the motor, um, I guess not a bunch, but some work into the motor, uh, I have a car that you can't drive, and uh, I'm a dedicated person, so I'm going to try and fix it. So this video is going to be about getting this motor out of the car. It's going to be all piecemeal, probably hard to follow, uh, but maybe it'll help some people. So here we go. Uh, first thing to do uh, when you want to pull a motor out of one of these things is uh, turn the heater on full. Uh, that way we can drain the coolant out. Second step, get the car up on jack stands. Uh, jack stands are absolutely critical. Do not go under a car without jack stands. Uh, yes, these probably aren't the best, but they've been with me for a long time uh, and they have never failed. Um, obviously, because I'm still alive. Uh, so, car safely up on jack stands. Best thing to do to get started, drain all the fluids. Uh, we've got coolant draining here. Uh, I've already drained the engine oil out of there. I'll show you what the drain cock for the radiator looks like. This is a non-turbo, so it's really easy to see. Uh, loosen that guy, fit a hose over it, direct it into a drain pan, all the coolant comes out. Uh, make sure that you loosen the cap on the coolant reservoir or vacuum uh, may keep some of the coolant in. Um, even once you do this, something to be aware of is that a lot of coolant ends up in the block. In order to get that out, you have to loosen a plug, which I don't even think we can see under here, uh, but it's back there. So we're not gonna get all the coolant out, but we'll get enough to uh, get the radiator, or sorry, the engine out without making too much of a mess. So uh, heater on, fluids drained. Next thing to do, take the wheels off. Uh, there's a couple ways you can tackle this uh, part of the operation. Uh, if you follow the Saab procedure, they don't go quite as far as I do. They are probably trying to save work uh, or save time for a professional mechanic. For me, it's just not worth it. Uh, so my approach is this. Uh, take the axle nut off entirely. Take the brake caliper off entirely. Just, uh, two bolts that go in uh, right here. You can see them now back in the caliper so I don't lose them. I always try to put bolts back where I came from so I don't have to figure out where they went to. Uh, I have the caliper hung from a spring so it's out of the way. Uh, on this car, there's an ABS uh, system. So we loosen this bolt back here and we pull the ABS sensor out. Uh, these things are a little expensive and they're a little delicate um, so you don't want to cause them any harm. Uh, I just tuck it up under the spring because the spring isn't going to go anywhere right now. Um, and uh, that's it for part one. Uh, repeat this on the other side and uh, we'll pick up in just a second. Okay, uh, to pick up, uh, continuing on on the right side, uh, what I've done is I have jacked up the lower A-arm, which allows me to insert my spacers under the upper A-arm. Uh, the other one's a little bit hard to see, but you can see it in there. Uh, the reason why you want spacers under the upper A-arm is that when I take the steering knuckle off, uh, which we're about to do, uh, the suspension will drop down to a point which makes putting the A-arm back on extremely difficult. So you just don't want to deal with that. Uh, Saab has a special tool which slips in here uh, between the frame and the upper A-arm, but some one inch uh, square aluminum tube works great. Uh, you'll see there's some deformities on there. Uh, I replaced these after five or six different engine swaps. So uh, these particular ones have probably done three or four at this point. Um, they're really old. Uh, I have a small selection of them and I just cut off a new piece of tube when I'm ready. Anyway, uh, so uh, jack up the A-arm, insert some spacers, and then come around to this side and I'm gonna pop off the tie rod end. Uh, there's a tool to do that. Some people use hammers and other stuff don't do it. You can rent this tool from Amazon, or sorry, from AutoZone. You can buy them on Amazon for about 15 bucks. Uh, it's just not worth messing around with. So slide the tool in there. We're gonna tighten this bolt down uh, and it will pop the um, uh, ball joint off. 
I highly, highly recommend um, that you take the nut that came off uh, out of the equation. It'll make quite a bang uh, when it goes off, but uh, you'll hear it. Just go ahead and do it right now. Done. Easy peasy. Uh, on to the other side. Okay, so now we've done the other side. Uh, next approach for me is uh, on the exhaust manifold. Grab your favorite penetrating oil. This actually really isn't the best, but it's what I got. Hose every bolt down here. These studs uh, go through the downpipe or the collector into the manifold. These are really not what you want to come out, what to come out. You want the nuts on the bottom, but sometimes you don't have a choice. So uh, I hit everything with penetrating oil. Nuts on the bottom, studs on the top. And whatever comes out, you're lucky. Uh, probably want to apply this once or twice uh, while you're working on the car. So I'm doing it early on, so it has a chance to sit there and work. Uh, obviously, this car is not terribly rusty, uh, despite its age. California's kind of nice for that. Uh, while you're here, undo the battery. Uh, I do negative and positive. You don't have to do the positive cable. You can leave the positive cable in the car, but for me, it's just so much easier to pull it out with the motor rather than fish it out. So, uh, positive cable terminal done, uh, clamp from the uh, fuel or the chassis rail done, and then up here, uh, disconnected from the junction box. That done. You can just uh, take the battery cable, sorry about that view, hang it over the distributor, and that way you can come out with the car. Underneath the car, I have moved the oil drain out of the way, put the uh, drain plug back in. Under here, on each side, you'll have the uh, inner driver off the transmission, and this is the boot, the inner boot for the CV. There is a, uh, Saab uses just a hose clamp here. Uh, if your CV has been replaced by a uh, random shop, uh, you may actually have uh, an earless step clamp or something like that there that you have to cut off. Uh, hopefully you still have the original uh, Saab hose clamp, easy to get off. Go ahead and take them both off, uh, one on each side, and you can let them sit there for a little bit. And then finally, I'm gonna go ahead and drain the transmission fluid uh, out of this car. I'm not reusing this transmission since it's hosed, so I'd rather just collect it while it's easy to collect. Uh, you know, personal point here, collect all your fluids. Don't mix your fluids. I've got collection for the uh, transmission fluid, for the coolant, and uh, over far away, sorry about the finger, uh, over there for the oil. Collect all your fluids. Don't let them leak out into the fucking world. Uh, keep them separate, take them for recycling. You know, don't be a dick. Uh, the drain plug for the transmission is a pretty beefy 12 millimeter hex. Um, I'm gonna use an impact on this, assuming I can get it in there with one hand, which I cannot. So you guys are gonna to have to use your imagination about me zipping this off with an impact tool. Okay, got the drain plug out. Uh, some not terrible, but not great oil came out. Uh, not as many chunks as I had anticipated, um, but the drain plug, uh, definitely covered with little furries. I mean, some is normal. That looks like a lot, but again, this car is over a quarter of a million miles on it, so who knows? Uh, doesn't change the diagnosis, transmission's hose, but anyway. So we're gonna set that guy aside. Get back up, come around the side of the car, and I'm gonna remove the steering knuckle entirely. So that's uh, two bolts right here, and two bolts down there, uh, take off the nuts, pull the bolts out. Sometimes they can be stuck. You may want to try some penetrating oil. You can tap them out with a hammer. Uh, really depends on where you live. These came out really easy because I did this whole operation yesterday as well, trying to fix the uh, problem that I was having to no avail. Anyway, uh, I'm going to take the steering knuckle off entirely. So those four bolts, and then I'm going to withdraw this whole thing, which looks like this when it's done. So the reason I do this uh, is to get this out of the way entirely. What Saab asks you to do is just take the top off. Uh, I wish I can show you here, maybe. Not a chance. All right, Saab just has you take the top of this thing out and uh, rock the 
uh, steering knuckle out, which allows you to disengage the axle from the transmission. But the two problems that I have with that approach are one, uh, when you do that, uh, the fluid or the oil, grease, whatever, uh, inside the CV joint just makes a terrible mess. And all that time while you're doing whatever it is you're doing, the CVs are just sitting there hanging out in space, collecting crap. So you got to cover them up. Um, also when you're putting the engine back in the car, it is incredibly frustrating to have to negotiate the, uh, CV joint while you're dropping 500 pounds of engine and transmission into the car. So, uh, I take the steering knuckle out in its entirety. Uh, I take the axle out in its entirety. Uh, that way you're just not dealing with that when you're trying to lower a motor into a car or pull it out for that matter. Uh, I will comment that you can leave the axle, uh, attached to the steering member. If you don't take the nut off, uh, for me, it's five bucks for a nut, uh, that I don't really care about replacing. It's just not a big deal. And I would much rather deal with more smaller, lighter parts than try to deal with complicated assemblies. So for me, uh, two nuts on the top, uh, where are we? Two nuts on the bottom, axle nut, pull the whole thing off, which gets you that assemble, assembly, and you can just leave the axle in the car for now. We're going to come back to that later on uh, when we're ready to draw the, uh, take the engine out. But now I'm basically done uh, under the car and everything else I got to do is up here. So we'll resume that in a minute. Okay, picking up in the engine bay, uh, some really simple steps. Uh, undo the uh, hose clamps for the upper radiator hose. Uh, one down here, one down here. If your car isn't a million years old uh, and has been properly maintained, there will be an electrical connector here. Unconnect or disconnect that guy. Unconnect quality English. Go ahead and remove the uh, upper radiator hose. Set that guy aside. Maybe he's a little coolant in there still, but hopefully not much. I'm going to come around the other side. Uh, hose clamp on the uh, uh, intake boot. Uh, disconnect the connector for the air mass meter. Uh, if you look down here, it's kind of hard to see. There's a little tiny screw that lives down here. Looks like that. Make sure you remove that and you can pull the whole air box assembly out get it out of the way. Set that guy aside. Then uh, go ahead and uh, undo the hose clamp that's on the coolant bottle. Remove that hose. Set that guy aside. Uh, next step is going to be uh, disconnecting and removing the radiator fans. Uh, you have to do that basically to have easy access to the lower radiator hose and trying to get the engine out around the fans is an impossibility. Uh, and in fact, in this case, because again, uh, I would rather do some extra steps, take some extra time rather than ever struggle. Uh, I'm actually going to remove the radiator as well. Uh, once you get, uh, this far, you can just undo two bolts, take the whole radiator out with a fan, easy peasy. So we'll do that in a sec. Okay. Radiator time. Uh, first step is to uh, remove the coil uh, to do that. That's normally in this bracket right here. It's a single 10 millimeter uh, bolt. Uh, undo that guy. Then you can withdraw the coil. I'm going to set that guy aside. Um, you're going to need to loosen the hose clamp that's on the uh, overflow hose. So uh, loosen that guy up. And then you're going to need to be really careful here. Uh, me more so than most because the uh, this is plastic over here. It gets brittle over time. And if you force it, uh, you can break this nipple off pretty easily. Um, so be gentle. Uh, I am not going to be able to do this with one hand without causing some catastrophe. So I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, next step in getting the radiator out, uh, unplug both fans. There's a single plug, uh, on both sides. You can see the green cable on the other side. That's the uh, radiator fan. Undo both of those. Uh, then it's two bolts on the top, uh, one on the left. And one over here on the right. Then the whole radiator, uh, as you can see, will fall back and you can carefully lift the whole thing out as an assembly. Um, but I forgot a step. I'll show you that too, guy. Down here is the uh, uh, radiator fan switch. Just two simple electrical connectors. Pull them off. Then you can go ahead and withdraw the entire radiator with the fans on it. Uh, you could remove the fans from the radiator. Uh, it takes a little bit more time. And for me, uh, again, work smart, not hard. 
Uh, having the radiator out of the way wins you like three inches of space for the front motor mount that you just don't have to deal with. Um, and it reduces the possibility of you, you know, hitting the radiator with the engine mount, which would just make you buy a new radiator. So get it out of the equation entirely. Um, that's about it for this step. Uh, we'll pick up in a second. Okay, uh, radiator's out, easy peasy. Uh, you will notice that I took the cap off the distributor. Um, gives me a little extra clearance for the radiator, probably advised. Uh, if you have a turbo car, be very careful when you're dealing with the distributor. That electrical connector on there is uh, gold these days. They are impossible to get. And uh, if you damage that connector, you may end up with a car that stalls periodically. And that is no fun for anybody. Uh, anyway, uh, next project is uh, disconnecting various things that are connected to the motor. Uh, first thing I did was disconnected the evap hose. Uh, earlier cars, they'll be rubber. Later cars will be plastic. Uh, either way, anything that runs from the body uh, to the car, to the motor, uh, needs to come off. So I've got that off. Uh, I've got this vacuum hose off. Uh, the throttle cable is easy. Just use a screwdriver to bend this out. Then you can pull out the throttle cable. Uh, throttle cable is another one of those unobtainium, very expensive things. This one is slightly damaged. It's just abraded, but it's not broken. You really don't want to break the throttle cable. Uh, that can be an issue down the road. So just be careful with that uh, and everything else for that matter. Uh, so anyway, uh, undo the clip, let the cable hang out. There's a little clip right in here. Then you can uh, withdraw the cable, set it aside in a safe place. Uh, I just leave it over here. Uh, you know, it's not a bad idea to tape it or zip tie it so it doesn't flop back over, but just, you know, take care of it. Um, that's really about it for this side, uh, right now. I go back to the other side. And now it is time to, uh, start undoing the wiring harness. Uh, move this distributor cap back over here so it's not in the way. You'll probably have a bunch of zip ties, uh, just cut them. Fun fact is, uh, when I did this uh, a few weeks ago, trying to get the motor running, I cleaned everything up, made it all nice. Now I gotta take it apart. Uh, all the clips on these motors are really easy to get undone. Push the clip in, withdraw the connector. If the connector doesn't come off, rock it gently. Don't pull, don't tug, don't pry. There's no reason to break anything. Uh, I've seen all manner of crazy people uh, doing crazy things to these guys. So uh, unplug every electrical connector. There's quite a few. And then the final step is gonna be undo the ground cables. Uh, that's these guys. One thing that uh, catches my eye about this motor, uh, which I'll call out, is that normally there's a lifting lug right here. It's missing. So getting this motor out of the car is gonna uh, require a little ingenuity. I might even put a bracket on there to make it easy. I'll uh, show that when I get there. But either way, uh, all the electric connectors, all the vacuum connectors over there, uh, anything that's on the motor, uh, from the motor, like the fuel rail, you don't have to worry about that guy. Uh, undo the ground cables and uh, I'm gonna work on that and then we'll get to the next step. <laughs> okay, uh, I am done with that phase. Um, just as a recap for uh, people who may not be familiar with everything, uh, here's the things that you gotta disconnect. Uh, there's four injectors, one, two, three, four. There's a coolant temperature sensor uh, down there. If you have a uh, earlier car that has a vacuum powered shift up light. You will have another electrical connector uh, way down there, which is a little bit pain to get to, but it's not one of the uh, clip on types like the fuel injectors. Uh, it's just a couple spades, so you can just pull it off pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll have the connector for the uh, idle control valve, which is over here mounted to the thermostat. You'll have a connector on the throttle position sensor, which is mounted to the uh, throttle body. Uh, one thing I'll call out on this car, you'll notice a little ravine right here. Uh, on these cars, the coolant runs through the throttle body. Uh, I took that out uh, several months ago. Uh, lots of reasons, uh, hopefully all good ones. None of them performance related. Uh, that whole take the coolant out of the throttle body to gain 50 horsepower, that's an urban myth. Uh, anyway, uh, connector on the uh, throttle position sensor. Uh, you'll remember we removed the air box earlier where the air mass meter connector uh, existed. So we already had undone that. Um, that is about it for the fuel injection harness in terms of uh, components. Uh, again, you'll have two grounds. They may be here. 
uh, on a later car. On an earlier car, this is the bracket that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it normally sits right here and there's grounds here. Uh, those guys need to come off. Uh, once that's all done, uh, you can disconnect the connector at the AC compressor and then the whole harness uh, just flops over the side of the car like this. Uh, you can leave it there, it's out of the way, it's in a safe place. Um, and then the final step uh, that I did in this phase is I disconnected the two hoses, these guys, uh, from the heater control valve, uh, these guys right here. A couple notes on that. Keep track of which hose goes to which port. If you connect the wrong hose to the wrong port, you will either have heat all of the time or uh, some other weird effect. There actually is, uh, I don't want to call it polarity, but there's a proper location for each hose, so make sure you mark that. Also, when you are pulling the hoses off the heater control valve, be gentle. Don't break, crush, destroy that heater control valve. It is plastic, it is old. Um, obviously, if you touch it and it falls apart, you're gonna be replacing it anyway. But if you're nice to it and it's in good shape, uh, it's durable. So just be nice when you disconnect it. And uh, I'll say this again later, uh, but when you're tightening the hose clamps for these two hoses onto the heater control valve and we put this whole car back together, don't over tighten them. I have gotten more cars than I wanna claim uh, where those things have been crushed by people trying to fix leaky hoses by tightening hose clamps. If your car leaks, it's because the hose is broken. Tightening the hose clamp isn't a fix, it's just breaking something else. So, uh, you know, be cautious of that, be cognizant when you're tightening hose clamps. There is too much. Um, that's all that I'm gonna do uh, tonight on this car. Uh, it's been uh, about 90 minutes, I'm an hour and a half into this. I'm probably about halfway done pulling the motor. Um, the next phase is actually pretty straightforward. It's some big nuts and bolts, uh, some work on the clutch, and uh, I'm gonna have to take the hood off the car, um, but I'll need some help with that. Um, and that's about it. So just a quick recap of what we did in this phase is uh, we took the steering knuckles off, um, which is uh, probably the big time sink in this operation. We drained a bunch of fluids. You'll see I have not been perfect. Um, I goofed up on the lower radiator hose, so I probably lost a, a liter of coolant on the ground. I'm not feeling great about that, but I yeah, did my best. Um, we disconnected the wiring harness. We disconnected the, sorry, uh, the battery cables. We hosed down the um, exhaust manifold collector uh, with uh, penetrating oil. If you have a turbo, same operation. Uh, penetrating oil, penetrating oil. Uh, just keep doing it uh, to maximize your chances of success there. You don't want to strip anything out or break it. Um, we took out the radiator and the radiator fans, which was easy. We removed the coil, which was easy. On the other side of the motor, we disconnected a bunch of vacuum hoses like the EVAP. Um, we disconnected the heater control valve. Uh, we removed the air box. Uh, all pretty much nuts and bolts stuff. And in fact, one thing I'll show you because uh, I always enjoy this. Uh, I'm, yeah, I don't know, maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a weirdo. Is that at this point in time, this is all of the hardware that I have collected. Uh, the clip for the throttle body, uh, hose clamp for the overflow from the radiator and the clamp from the coil, plus this little tiny screw, uh, which I should probably put back here so I don't lose it. Oops. Uh, little tiny screw that holds the air box in. Uh, if you keep putting things back where you found them, uh, it makes putting the car back together much faster, much straightforward. I'm now down to four pieces of hardware, uh, which are very clear as to where they go. Uh, that is delightful. Um, Everything else is in the place that it belongs, attached to what it belongs to. So this is going to be a really simple reassembly process. Anyway, uh, that's it. Uh, I will uh, pick up with this uh, probably tomorrow. Okay, we're back to it. Uh, first task today is we're going to mess with the uh, belts. We have to do a few things. Uh, first, we're going to end up needing to take the um, AC compressor off the motor. I'm gonna leave it in the car because I don't wanna drain the system. I actually don't even know if it's charged, but just as a matter of course, uh, unmounting the AC compressor from the engine uh, is the easy option. So uh, we'll get to that part later. So first thing is uh, we're gonna take the belt off. I've already done that. Uh, it's a little hard to see because uh, it's tight back here, uh, but there's only two bolts that you need to loosen. Uh, one is uh, that guy right here. Just loosen that guy. And then there's another bolt that's right here uh, that is normally attached to this bracket. So I literally took the bolt out, loosened that guy, dropped the bracket, put the bolt back where it belongs. Then I can take the belt off. The next thing we got to do is the power steering bolt, or sorry, belt, not bolt. Uh, power steering is a little bit difficult to get to, but really not that bad. 
Uh, there is a bolt that holds the bracket right here. I have already removed it. And there's another that holds the tensioner uh, right down here, just two. Uh, you have to remove them both in order to uh, move the uh, pump enough to get the belt off. So right now, those bolts are gone. Uh, I can move the pump around, which allowed me to get the belt off. Uh, a quick note about uh, this bolt, uh, the outer more bolt. It's kind of hard to see. There we go, down there. Uh, it's a carriage bolt. Uh, it has a little square head on it. That head engages the back of the motor mount. Uh, so you don't have to hold it when you're undoing the nut, but do not lose that bolt uh, or you will have a hard time replacing it because metric carriage bolts in the US are a little bit difficult to find. Uh, it will tend to be lost uh, down behind the motor mount. Uh, just keep track of it once you remove it. Uh, I leave these two bolts out. So I'm gonna put them uh, in the gutter right here. Um, the reason for all this is, is the goal, just like the AC compressor, which we're gonna remove from the motor and leave in the car, I am also going to unbolt the uh, power steering pump and leave it in the car when I pull the engine out. There's one more bolt, the bottom pivot bolt, uh, but we'll get back to that in a second. Final step of this process is going to be uh, taking the belt off the alternator and water pump. Uh, it's really uh, quite easy to do, especially once you've uh, pulled the two heater uh, hoses out of the way. Uh, all you need to do is remove this nut, which allows you to move this tensioner around. Once the tensioner is no longer engaged, you can rock the um, alternator up, pull the belts off, and then the alternator swings out of the way. The reason we need to do that part is because there's a bolt down here. You can see it underneath the... Uh, underneath that wire, um, we need to loosen that guy, not remove it, just loosen it. That's one of three that holds the AC compressor in. So I'll uh, do that in a second, but I wanted to uh, show that. Okay, so now I'm ready to <clears throat> uh, get rid of the uh, alternator, or sorry, not the alternator, the AC compressor. Not actually gonna move it at this time. I just got everything loosened up. So that's these two bolts right here. Uh, they're six millimeter hex. I'm just gonna remove those guys and set them uh, up in the gutter. Uh, that way I know where they go. And then I have loosened that bolt uh, down there. So now I can actually move the AC compressor completely out of the way. Uh, I'm gonna leave it uh, right where it is because uh, I don't wanna put additional stress on the hoses. But when time comes to pull the motor, uh, all I need to do is pull the whole AC compressor out with its bracket and just set it on a towel on the windshield. That is the conventional place to locate it, makes everything easy. Uh, while I'm over here, I'm gonna do the next few things, which is disconnect some more electrical. Uh, a few things I gotta do is I have to connect or disconnect the alternator excite wire. It's kind of hard to see, but uh, it's right down here. I'll also disconnect the oil pressure uh, sensor, which is right there. <clears throat> Need to disconnect the knock sensor, which is under here. This is one of those um, uh, amp TE uh, power timer connectors that has a little push uh, clasp to let it out. So you got to be careful. It's hard to get your hand under there. Um, it's really hard to see and I apologize, uh, but it's uh, down between those intake runners. It's hard to get your hands down there, but you got to do it. Uh, if you have big hands, uh, <laughs> get your daughter to do it. Uh, I don't have one of those, so I'm going to have to uh, ram my hands down there. That's just how it goes. Uh, the other thing I got to disconnect is the starter wire, which is uh, that yellow wire right here. Because I disconnected the entire battery positive cable, I don't need to worry about that. So I'll just leave that guy exactly where it is. Um, and then on this car, because it is a non-turbo with a crank sensor, uh, I also need to disconnect the electrical for the crank sensor. So I'm gonna work on that and then uh, we'll get to the next step. Okay, I realized in my uh, previous step that I forgot uh, one additional wire you have to disconnect. Uh, that's this guy right here. That's the uh, temperature sensor for the uh, gauge in the cabin. There's a single yellow wire. Uh, disconnect that guy as part of that last step. Uh, when you're done, you'll end up with a harness that you can basically just stuff completely out of the way over here. And this is one of the reasons I like to just remove the air box, get, it out, of the, uh, get out of the equation entirely. Um, one, I can clean up that gunk down there, uh, so I have a nice clean engine bay, but also uh, I get wiring out of the way without having to worry about it getting crushed or anything like that when I put it back in. Uh, anyway, on to the next. Uh, there's two ground wires we have to deal with. Uh, one, 
uh, you'll see right here, uh, it goes between, I've already loosened it, so it just fell out, uh, but it goes between the throttle body right here, um, or the intake manifold, and the body uh, over here. Some cars won't have this, it depends on the year, um, and you know, really honestly what mechanic worked on it. Uh, if you don't have it, it's probably not gonna break you or make you either way, uh, but don't forget it and end up ripping it out. So. Uh, if it's factory, it'll have a spade connector on it. So just loosen the bolt, pull it out and tuck it out of the way so that it doesn't get crushed or broken. I am going to stick it behind the brake uh, line right there. And then on the other side of the car is the other ground wire we have to deal with, which is the main ground uh, that goes uh, from the battery cable uh, to the transmission. This bolt uh, comes out, get the ground cable out of the way and just stick the bolt right back where it came from so that you don't lose it. Um, this is the primary cover for the transmission. Uh, these bolts are a specific length. If you put it in too long or too short, you'll have a problem. So this is one of those bolts you just really don't want to mess up. Uh, you could end up causing some damage to the transmission case if it's too long, for example. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, when you're done, just uh, tuck the battery cable out of the way so you don't crush it. And uh, we're done with this part and we'll move on to the next. Okay, we got another simple step here. We're gonna disconnect uh, the fuel from the fuel rail. There's two connections you have to do. Uh, one is the inlet to the fuel rail, the high pressure line. It is absolutely critical that you use two wrenches. One goes on the hex uh, that's built onto the fuel rail, the other uh, onto the banjo bolt itself. You must hold this when you're loosening the banjo bolt. If you just try to loosen the banjo bolt, you have a serious risk of permanently tweaking the fuel rail if that happens. Uh, it will never seal right again. You'll have a fuel leak, uh, you create a fire hazard. Always hold the hex. That's just a general rule of working on cars. Um, the other connection is the fuel pressure return uh, off the regulator. This hose clamp is what I'm gonna loosen. Uh, I'm pretty darn sure uh, that if it's a factory clamp, it's just a little spring clamp. Uh, it's not an actual worm gear clamp like this is. Someone's been here, uh, somebody put this here, uh, if I was guessing, I would probably guess that they use the wrong size uh, return line. Um, 5 16 fuel injection line works absolutely perfectly. It fits on snugly and doesn't go anywhere. Probably this isn't that. It could be low pressure line or something like that. Uh, and they stuck a hose clamp on there to make it work. It's low pressure. It's not a big deal. It's just, uh, I, I hate it when people take shortcuts like this. So it kind of gets on my nerves. Uh, I'll probably end up replacing that return line uh, when I put the car back together. But anyway, uh, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, fuel inlet fuel return and uh, then we move on to the next okay here we are uh, underneath the car uh, back down here for uh, the next section of this guy uh, I am sorry that the camera is upside down but it's probably the easiest way to illustrate this for you guys um, what I'm looking at right now is a transmission drain plug so going back towards the back of the car uh, we've got three things to do down here uh, two are quite easy one is a giant pain in the butt um, so just uh, be prepared for that. First thing is uh, we need to remove the uh, speedometer cable. This car should be pretty easy, but I'm still going to need a tool apparently. I've had it off recently. Uh, they are very prone to getting stuck. Um, I would recommend hitting it with penetrating oil uh, if you have that option. Sometimes that's not enough. Do not mangle that. Don't break it. Uh, these cables are very hard to find these days and there aren't replacements. Uh, if you can't get this off with a pair of like slip joint pliers or something like that, uh, another option is you can remove the entire speedometer drive gear. Uh, to do that, uh, we just need to remove this bolt uh, right here. When you remove that, you can then remove the bracket that holds the entire speedometer gear in here. Uh, if you go that route, which is completely fine, just remember that you're gonna have to retorque that bolt to a proper uh, specification. Otherwise, you know, you're dealing with the drive shaft and the carrier bearings and all that. So you want to maintain that. Uh, I'm going to reiterate, uh, if this nut doesn't come off fairly easily with your hands or a slip joint plier, just go straight to this. The risk of not doing that is there's a little plastic uh, hex uh, under here, which this bracket rides against that holds the speedometer gear stable. If you mess that up, uh, the speedometer, it just never works right again. And then getting this off in the future is extremely difficult. Uh, so 
Try this with slip joints. If it doesn't work pretty readily, just remove the bolt and the bracket uh, in its entirety. That's my advice. Uh, so I'm gonna do that in a second. Uh, task two, pretty straightforward. Uh, that's the crank right there. Sorry about the exposure. Uh, this nut up here, uh, I need to remove. This is the bottom pivot right here for the uh, power steering pump. Once that nut is undone, I can move the whole power steering uh, pump towards the back of the car, basically unhook it from the engine. So when I lift the engine out, the power steering pump stays where it is. Uh, be aware when you do this, there's a couple rubber bushings in there. There's a sort of special shaped washer in there. Uh, you need to keep track of those. Those bushings are very difficult to get. Uh, I think the only source right now is parts for Sobs in the UK. So one possibility if you're gonna pull this motor out is just order those bushings right now because they're probably shot to hell and uh, having them on hand for when you put everything back together is a real help. Uh, these look okay to me and I've been in here before so uh, I think they're fine. I'm probably not gonna replace them, uh, but just be aware of that. Final thing that you have to deal with is the shift coupler. Uh, that's this guy right here, this rubber guy. Uh, hopefully that exposure isn't as bad as it looks on my phone, but it, uh, the light's kind of rough. Um, there's two ways that you can get this off. Uh, one way is to undo that nut and then you have to push a taper pin out the other direction. You can use a clamp to try and do that. Do not hit it with a hammer. You'll ruin the seal. Um, I just, uh, it's just kind of a pain to get. I generally don't remove the taper pin. I believe that's what Saab tells you to do but it's so difficult uh, to do under the car uh, that I just don't mess with it. The other way you can do it, let me come back over this direction. Let's see if you guys can see that. Right back there, uh, right back there is a screw and a nut. If you remove that, um, then you're equally free. It's ever so slightly more difficult to put the shifter back into position if you go that route, uh, but the amount of trouble it saves you with a taper pin, uh, it's the route that I would go. Um, the way I approach this is right now the car is in fourth gear, um, which makes uh, this pretty easy to get to. You can actually get to this nut and bolt from the top of the car, so that could be an option. It's also pretty easy from down here, but put the transmission in fourth, either remove the taper pin or remove the nut and bolt, uh, and then your transmission is free. So that's my tasks for right now. Uh, speedometer cable, power steering pump pivot, and taper pin, or uh, shift coupler. I'm gonna knock those guys out and then we'll come back for the next start. Okay, we're back here uh, under the car. Uh, I've accomplished my three tasks. Uh, you can see the speedometer cable is just uh, dangling down there. That's the best place for it to be. Uh, it just needs to be out of the way so when you lift the engine out, you're not uh, pulling it with. Uh, again, that will not be good for it. Uh, I removed the nut and now you can see that my uh, power steering pump is completely free. Uh, when I lift the engine out, I will clear this stud right here and the pump just stays there so I don't need to drain the fluid. Uh, I will tell you guys, uh, since we're down here, when you pull the engine out of the car, it is the absolute best time to uh, replace your power steering hoses. There's three of them. There's this big fat uh, uh, suction hose from the reservoir and it leaks all of the time. Uh, it's easy to replace when the engine is out. I would just do it. Um, there are a uh, high pressure and a return hose as well, which come off the rack. Uh, one goes uh, actually, you can see it uh, right up there. That is the high pressure hose from the pump to the rack. And then there's a return from the rack up to the reservoir. Those three hoses uh, represent like 50 or 60 bucks on Rock Auto um, from Gates, which is a pretty solid brand. Uh, just replace them. Uh, save yourself some leaks and uh, spend the 50 bucks. Uh, that's the end of my soapbox there. So um, final thing is I have disconnected the... Um, shift coupler so this guy is now not attached to the shifter in the car uh that is uh easily done with that pinch bolt and uh that way i don't have to worry about that taper pin which sucks and then the final thing which i've done down here is i have uh, unbolted the exhaust manifold you can see all four studs remained in the manifold uh, i put the nuts back on but the collector slash downpipe is now out of the way uh, so that's uh, another step closer to pulling the motor out of the car uh, at this point, I am done uh, underneath the car with the sole exception of pulling the CVs out. Uh, I will do that absolutely last uh, so that I don't have to worry about grease going everywhere and dust and whatnot collecting in there. Um, but now we're going uh, back up to the top of the car, which I will try to do elegantly. <laughs> okay. 
I've got two tasks up here left. Uh, I think it's two. Uh, one is quite simple, which is unbolt the motor mounts. Uh, on the passenger side, the right side of the car, there are, I recommend doing all three bolts, one, two, three. You really only need to do the outside two. The difference is, is that uh, if you only undo the outside two, the motor mount itself has to come out with the engine, um, which is fine, but if it snags on something or whatever else, uh, you're just gonna end up breaking that motor mount. So I always remove the center nut as well. That way the motor mount will most likely fall out and stay with the car, and I run very little risk of breaking it. Uh, I have to undo the front motor mount. Uh, this is a solid style motor mount. Um, so removing it is just these two bolts. Um, if you have a hydraulic front mount, it's still those same two bolts. Um, earlier cars are slightly different, but starting in like, I guess it was probably 86 or 87, it's those two bolts no matter what. The right side of the car, or sorry, left side of the car, uh, driver's side is a little bit more complicated, uh, at least in appearance, but it's incredibly easy to uh, get the motor mount out of this car. I've seen everybody blow it, so I'll call it out there are two bolts that you need to get out. One is that guy and the other is that guy. Uh, the top bolt is very long and it's difficult for it to um, clear the uh, oil filler. Be careful the oil filler, it will crack pretty easily, uh, especially near the base. If it does that, it will leak. So bottom bolt, real small, easy to get out, 14 millimeter head. Top bolt, slightly more difficult, but if you do them both at the same time, it generally comes out pretty easy for you. Once those two bolts are out, that is all you need to do on that side of the car and the engine comes out. Uh, so task one uh, is undo the motor mounts. But before I do that, um, I've got one annoying thing I gotta do, which uh, is in a way optional, but uh, I need to do it for what I'm doing. And that is I need to prepare the clutch um, to be removed. If you're not gonna separate the engine and transmission, you do not have to do this step. But if there's even a chance that you're going to separate the engine and the transmission, uh, you absolutely need to insert a spacer while you still have hydraulics. Uh, if you don't do that, the whole operation gets a lot more difficult. So what I'm gonna work on right now is getting the clutch cover off so I can insert that spacer. And um, I'll show you what that looks like when I'm done. Okay, we're uh, ready to proceed. Uh, first, I'm going to show you uh, where to look to get the uh, clutch cover off. It's easier to see with the uh, things or with the clutch cover gone. This is one position. There's probably going to be a bolt. It'll also be a support for the lower radiator hose. Uh, don't lose either. Uh, it may also be secured right here. This will be a bracket, which you can see right here, for the um, battery positive cable. There's going to be a bolt right through here, the smaller one, uh, up at the top. And then on the far side, uh, we're gonna be a bolt, let's see, uh, kind of symmetrical there at the bottom. You can see it behind the battery cable. Those are the three places, uh, four places, sorry, that the clutch cover will be secured. Check them all. Uh, you really don't wanna rip the clutch cover trying to get it off. Some people get kind of bananas and just decimate the thing. It's just not that hard to get off if you remove all the bolts. You will also need to uh, bend these battery support brackets back in order to slide it off, so be aware of that. So my approach here is to prop the um, clutch down, which I have creatively done with a breaker bar and a roll of paper towels. Uh, you can see that's holding that down. It's, it's a lot easier with a helper, but this generally works. With that done, I can insert uh, the tool. And you can see the little handle sticking out here. This is the official factory Saab tool. It's available under the part number CTA 3750. It goes in and out of production, but Amazon frequently has it. Uh, e Euro Parts uh, has it, Auto House AZ has it. Um, it's a generic tool, but it's specific to Saab. So uh, just Google CTA 3750. If you can't find it, you're not even remotely out of options. Anything that fits in that spot uh, will work great. One thing that I frequently use is some copper brake line, uh, 3 16 uh, It's just bended into a circle. It's really easy to form with your hands. You can buy this stuff these days at most auto parts stores, so just buy a foot or two and bend it into a circle and stuff it in there. Once that's done, and this isn't necessary for what we're doing, uh, I've removed the pressure plate bolts. There's six of them around, but now you can see uh, 
this guy can flop around because there's clearance even with the clutch depressed. So this is what I need to facilitate getting the clutch out later. So I'm not gonna do anything further right now. Um, eh, you know what, I think I, I'm gonna revise my opinion. I'm probably not gonna change that slave cylinder. So I'm gonna go ahead and dismantle this right now. Uh, leave the slave cylinder with the car. That way I don't have to worry about bleeding it when I put it all back together. So I'm gonna do that in a sec. Uh, in the interim, I've gone ahead and removed the motor mount bolts, the two up front. You'll notice they're asymmetrical. It's because whoever owned this car at some point in the past broke that motor mount uh, or that bolt. So that's lovely. Um, they used a bolt in the nut. It's fine. It's just annoying, uh, whatever. So those two bolts, I got those two bolts out down here. That bracket, when you get it out for the left side motor mount, looks like this. You can see the bottom bolt, top bolt, see how long it is. Um, that needs to clear the dipstick. So be careful when you're doing it. And then I remove the three bolts on the passenger side. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get the clutch out uh, and then we'll come back to this. All right, ready to take the clutch out. Uh, first thing is the slave cylinder is held in by three bolts. One here, one on the other side, one on the under, under side there. Uh, they are small, well, small headed Allen, but kind of long, have a washer. Uh, that's a five millimeter Allen hex. In order to get in there, what you have to do is modify an Allen wrench so that it fits. Uh, another thing I would recommend strongly, uh, hose all three down with penetrating oil. Uh, give it a half hour, whatever you can tolerate uh, before you try to remove them. If they strip out, uh, that's a problem and they definitely can strip out. Um, people go bananas, over tighten them, dissimilar metals, all of that. So uh, penetrating oil, five millimeter hex, get them all out. Once that's done, the slave cylinder is no longer attached. Um, so over here, there's a clip on the front of the transmission like this. Pull that guy off, which allows you to remove the cover off the front of the primary drive. It sits in there. With the cover off, you can spin the oil slinger out. It's just uh, finger tight. Do not lose this thing. You, I don't think you can buy them anymore. Uh, if they break or it's gone, uh, you're gonna have lubrication problems in your transmission. Uh, this little plastic thing is actually really important. Uh, it keeps oil circulating in the primary drive so the chains don't bind up. Uh, once that's done, you need to get the um, input shaft out. It's kind of hard to see, but uh, right in there, I think it's an M8 bolt. You can just thread an M8 bolt in there. Um, let me see if I've got one sitting around. Let's see, how about a clutch pressure plate bolt? Bingo. Thread that in, then you can just use a wrench to wiggle it and pop it out. Um, and then you cannot, uh, actually we can in this case. Normally you can't withdraw the input shaft uh, completely because the radiator is here. Since we're pulling the engine out and the fluid is drained, I can move this whole thing out of the way. But it doesn't matter whether you pull it out or not. All we need to do is disengage the input shaft um, from the clutch. And then once that's done, the entire clutch, uh, pressure plate, disc, and uh, slave cylinder, they all have to come out at once. It's uh, it's kind of a Tetris jigsaw puzzle type thing, but if your spacer is installed, your pressure plate bolts are off, uh, it does work, don't don't lose hope. Um, it's just a little fidgety. It's This is an 8.5 inch clutch because it's a non-turbo. It's even more fidgety with a nine inch clutch uh, on the uh, later turbo. So just be aware, uh, it's supposed to be fidgety. Uh, be patient, get it out. Okay, we are uh, ready, as far as I know, to uh, pull this motor out of the car. Uh, it's three hours uh, from about the time I started, uh, including the time I guess I took to uh, this, take this video. Uh, it's not too much work. Um, what you'll see in this last step that I did is I went ahead and pulled the clutch out. Uh, I reassembled the input shaft um, and followed my, put all the bolts back where they came from so I don't have to figure out where they went later. Uh, I have zip tied the throwout bearing to the slave cylinder so that it doesn't pop off. Um, I only had this happen once, but one time the inner part of the slave cylinder pushed out of the outside when I probably accidentally stepped on the clutch or something like that. Uh, zip tying it is at least helps prevent that from happening. So um, this part now stays with the car. So I am just gonna set it aside where it's not in the way. Let me go ahead and pop the uh, 
battery cable back up here. Sorry, so it does not uh, get damaged or lost during this operation. Get these guys out of the way. All right, so uh, I'm gonna do a quick recap. I don't know how accurate it's gonna be, um, but uh, hopefully pretty good. So I'm gonna go around the other side of the car. So I pulled the steering members off entirely. Uh, I did that because I wanna be able to remove the axles completely so that I don't have to fight with them later on. Uh, there's spacers in the upper A-arm. You can see they're still holding, uh, still deformed, but uh, still there. And they'll be there probably for uh, five or six more days. Uh, got the brake caliper zip tied up to the spring, easy peasy. All three bolts uh, or nuts on the motor mount have been removed. That way the motor mount can do whatever it wants, irrespective of the engine. Um, down here, which is kind of hard to see, I've got the power steering pump completely disengaged from the motor. It's gonna stay with the car. I've got the uh, AC compressor unbolted uh, from the bottom and from the top. It's also gonna stay with the car. Again, I'll just flop it up onto the windshield, put a towel down so it doesn't scratch or break the windshield, but just leave it uh, sitting there so that I don't have to decompress uh, the AC system. Uh, the wiring harness is removed from the engine and is flopped over the side. I've got the battery cables removed from the battery. The positive is completely free of the car, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, free of the chassis, and it's just laid over the motor. Um, that requires undoing it from this junction box. The ground cable stays with the car. Uh, I have left it here. It's unbolted uh, from the transmission, although I guess I could do one more bolt and take it out of the car. There's not really a reason to do that. Uh, exhaust manifold, I penetrated, uh, man, phrasing, I think we're still doing that. Uh, I put penetrating oil uh, on there early on so that the uh, stud nuts were easy to get off and leave the collector sitting down there. Uh, front motor mount is unbolted, radiator is removed, clutch is removed. On the other side of the car, I unbolted, or sorry, disconnected the wiring harness, uh, which is the alternator. Uh, temperature sensor, oil pressure sensor, probably some other stuff, uh, and laid that down here. I unbolted the fuel lines from the fuel rail, and they're laying here. Uh, word of caution, they're plastic, or at least the, the feed is plastic, and they are both plastic back down here. If you bend them too tightly, they will break and leak, so be nice to them. Uh, I have disconnected the throttle cable and laid it to the side. I disconnected the uh, heater hose uh, from the heater control valve, uh, obviously the upper radiator hose and lower radiator hose are removed to uh, get the radiator out. The air box is gone. Um, this motor mount on this side is removed. Uh, two bolts and the bracket just pulls out. Now the engine is free to come out. Uh, I'm not going to go underneath, but underneath we did the um, uh, shift coupler. Uh, the, uh, I did the pinch bolt, not the taper pin. Uh, the power steering pump pivot bolt, the speedometer cable. I feel like that is my checklist. So at this point, my next step is gonna to be to um, get the hood off the car and pull the engine out. Um, this is a pretty quick operation if you think about it. Three hours including filming a video and uh, no troubles, uh, no difficulties. Uh, obviously if you've got rust, that's a whole different thing. Use a lot of penetrating oil. Um, I'm not sure I'm gonna do a put it back in the car video. I'm not sure what timing is gonna be like, but at least this gets you halfway there. Hope it helps.